Welcome to Inside the Majors, the survey edition this week. I have with me our fearless leader, I think that's the term that stuck the best, Mike, with us, Mike Olette, as I like to pronounce it. How are you, Mike? <laughs> wow. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know what that pronunciation was. I'm doing fine until I heard that. Great way to start the podcast then, to piss off your guest. Today, we'll be running through the survey results, both the mid-year survey and also the calendar survey, which was sent out to regular majors series league runners. Before we kick on with that, I'd like to congratulate our two top split winners from the Rock and Roll 400 on the weekend just gone. Two very contrasting races for the two winners, as it turned out. In Pacific, we had Dallas Pataska leading 369 of the 400 laps, starting from pole and pretty much dominating that race to a win. Uh, and in Atlantic, it was Togo Hisada who came from last to first. Moving to the topic for today, surveys. Most of you would be aware that we've had two surveys in recent weeks and months. The mid-year survey, which is the one that we're going to talk about first, came out after the Majors 24 and covered a very wide range of topics and issues for people to have their say on. So we're going to go through some of the results for that now. But before we go through the individual results, Mike, how does the series use this survey? Obviously, it's not just a, we put these questions out there and majority wins, that's what we're doing. How do you actually use the results once you've got the responses back from everybody? Yeah, I mean, it's a guide. It's a visible hand of influence on us that helps us, you know, it's a check to know if we're doing things the right way. Uh, I usually like to try to tailor the survey based on what are the challenges that we're facing that particular year. And we'll tailor some of the questions around that so that we can get an idea of if there's something we can do differently or if there's things that we're doing well. Uh, but mostly I like to, you know, I would prefer to focus on the things that we need to work on and leave the things that we're doing well alone. Thank you for sharing the results with me ahead of this. I've pulled together a few stats and uh, highlighted a few things that stuck out to me. Please feel free to bring up anything that I don't raise as well. I'll just throw a few things at you. And if you could give us an understanding of what you feel that means for the series and how that might inform you with changes, both calendar related when we get to that later, but also just the administrative or structure side of the, the series as we go. So kicking off, the first one that stood out to me was uh, obviously this year, we reduced the number of rounds in the main series back to 10. And people were asked about their thoughts on how many rounds they thought the series should include. Around half the respondents suggested that there should be an increase back to 12 for next year. So when you see results like that, how does that inform what you might do for the future? Yeah, so so we've gotten plenty of feedback over the last two years that 10 is not enough races. You know, we designed it with the idea of having a longer summer break because attendance has usually struggled during the summer months, summer in the Northern Hemisphere, I should say. And I was, given the feedback that we've received in the last years, I expected 14 to be like everybody was answering 14. So I was really surprised when 50% came back and said they thought 12 was the ideal number. I'm really happy with that because I think 12 is a good number. 14 is a fine number too, but you start getting races that are really close together and maybe in less ideal times. So I'm pretty happy with 12. I guess that'll be one of the few spoilers that we can announce for the next year is that we will be going to a 12 race calendar for the official series next year. That does not include the majors 24. So 12 regular points races. Just regarding the, the series and, and calendar announcements that will be coming out in the future via the podcast. So make sure that you tune in for all of the episodes in the future, because you'll hear it here first. There you go. There's a small little self-indulgent plug. One of the other questions uh, that comes up, and this comes up in uh, every series that I've been involved with, these next two questions actually that, that we'll be talking about, and that's drop rounds. No one's professional or very few people professional at this, at, at this game. Oh, I daughter in the swear jar, I use the G word, at this online sim racing business. So obviously people are going to miss things because of real life. The number of drop rounds that you allow in a series has a big bearing on championship structures and point standings. People were asked whether they wanted to maintain the current two drop rounds or reduce that uh, to one or even none. Uh, and again, 50% of people seem pretty happy with two drop rounds and there wasn't a lot of support for none at all. So drop rounds will obviously still be part of the, the series moving forward, yes? Yep. And that's one of those ones that it's always a, there's a more vocal opinion against drops in, in the discord or in chat or in Facebook than is in what's reality in terms of what the general populace would like. And most people, like you said, they, they understand that we're busy and, and it is a series that, that spans the whole year and you hate to have 
one vacation that's planned during the year or one business trip or one whatever kind of take you out of any any sort of hope at a championship. So for sure, I think drop runs will, main, will maintain a, a part of what we're doing. So I, I will say, though, when with only 10 races, two felt like a lot or feels like a lot, you know, it's 20% of the rounds. I think if we increase the number of races, I think we're good. In terms of drops in the past, we've split things where your two drops were used with one on the oval side and one on the road side. Do you feel like that's something that the series might look at changing in the future, pending how the schedules fall, of course? Yeah. It's something that we think about every year, to be honest, you know, and the series is designed to be a test of your skill in all sorts of different disciplines, uh, but, but it's, it's a little even too broad to say your skill in oval and road, right? Because, it, it, you know, a lot, there's a lot of road disciplines that don't look like one another. <laughs> and even oval, you know, the Speedway 500 and the Rock and Roll 400 don't look anything alike. You know, they're four corners and there are an oval technically, but they're different races altogether. So would we allow drops from the same discipline? Sure. I mean, it's possible and it, it is possible. It's something that we think about regularly. Another issue which comes up in, as I said, all leagues that I've ever been involved with is the, the issue of fast repairs. Majors has always main, has always carried a single fast repair for every race. And the survey results certainly put to bed any question of there being more than one. That's for certain, for certain. But it seems the majority are pretty happy with that and want to continue with that. There's always a little bit of sentiment towards not having any. Some people feel that having fast repairs increases the aggression of drivers and the accidents actually go up when you have fast repairs. I personally don't think that's, that's my experience, but so there was a bit of support for removing the fast repairs, but I think the survey suggests that yeah, people are pretty happy with it. Would that be your understanding of the data as well? Mark? Well, yeah, six, 65% want to keep one fast repair. Here's how I've always looked at it. Number one, I've always felt like if the damage model from a standpoint of both the physical damage that you take on during an incident and the repairability and or non-repairability and the time that it takes to repair that damage, it, the closer and closer that that gets to real world, the more inclined I would be to remove the fast repair. Knowing that you can repair a, a huge array of things makes it more and more realistic to remove it, number one. Number two, and this is the one where we're certainly not there yet, but you know, when, when we think of realism, people will say, well, fast repairs aren't realistic. And I say, yep, you're absolutely right. But if you're going to use that as the argument, you know, my counter to that is how many drivers finish a race. And if you remove the fast repair in any series I've participated in, and certainly in, in officials, the number of finishing drivers percentage of the field is far less, like significantly less than any real world series. And of course, you could say, well, we're not professionals, and that's true. But again, we don't want, you know, the Indy 500 on iRacing is a great example because it happens every year where 33 cars will start. And if you get 10 people that actually finish the race in any split across all the splits in the official Indy 500, you're doing good. And if you get two or three or four on the lead lap, you're doing good. To me, that is not the Indy 500. That is not how the real race goes. That doesn't resemble it in any way, shape, or form. If you look at our Speedway 500, you look at 20 to 25 cars finish the race, 15 cars finish on the lead lap, five or six cars are literally crossing the yard of bricks at the finish, unknown who's going to win. That's happened many times. I look at the realism of the outcome as a very important part of the decision of not having fast repairs. And I know that was a long answer, but that's the reason. Moving to divisions and regions. Yep. This year we saw the removal or the drop of the international region and people were asked about their thoughts for that of the people that did express an opinion. There seems to be support for bringing the international region back. There was also some discussion around potentially moving Pacific from its current Saturday slot, US Pacific time, of course, to a Sunday. How do you feel moving forward? The series would look at things like changes to timing, scheduling regions, that sort of stuff, both to put things back the way that they were or change things from how they've been? Yeah. So those are really good questions. The response was positive, but lukewarm on reinstating international. I know there's definitely a good handful, if not more of guys that are currently running with us, perhaps yourself included. I don't know, but certainly people like Dan Stevens, Jake, 
et cetera. Robert Northway, they would always run international and they've stuck with us you know, even when we haven't had it for the last two years. It's tough. I mean, you're running middle of the day on a Sunday. So that's tough when you've got family and, and other things that you'd like to be doing in your life. That's a sacrifice for sure. So again, the, the response was positive, but lukewarm to potential of bringing it back. And of course, I wonder how many people that raced in the international region previously didn't obviously take the survey. The question, of course, is can we sustain that dang region? When we started the international region in 2018, it was really important to me from having run the World Cup for so many years to give some representation to that area of the world, which just seems to get passed over in so many special events and so many big races and leagues and whatnot. I felt it really important to try to and, and adopt <laughs> the Oceania region uh, of the world and, and make something cool and worldwide. Um, and, and if we're being truthful, it's never taken hold the way that I wanted to. We wouldn't have dropped it if it, if it had. Um, but I just believe strongly there's between Australia and New Zealand alone, over 10,000 iRacers. Uh, you throw in, you know, Korea, Japan, et cetera. There's plenty of people. My experience is that while that region has definitely been passed over and has definitely been overlooked, in my opinion, by iRacing in general and by large private leagues as well. So if we're going to bring it back, I really want to craft something that is appealing to a wide range of people, both from the schedule that we run to the price point that we offer. And it's a tough challenge. It really is. Uh, but it's something that I would like to do. Ideally, it would be something that I would want to do. And then with regard to the Pacific region, I think that was the biggest mistake we ever made. I have to take full responsibility for that, but that was moving Pacific off a of Sunday and on to Saturday. And again, that was done as a way to still include <laughs> the international guys, the, the Australian, New Zealand drivers to say, well, if, if we don't do that, there's literally no place for them to run because Pacific is on Sunday, U.S. time, that's Monday for you guys. And then the Atlantic region is in the middle of the night, you know, early, early morning, like one, two in the morning on a Sunday morning. So, uh, or Monday morning even. So this is not like would, you're trying to be silly enough to do that series, is it? That'd be terrible. Well, who would do that? Uh, who would do that? <laughs> so we made that change to try to keep together as many of the loyal Australian, New Zealand drivers as we could. And, and honestly, we lost a decent number of our Pacific members that had been with us for a long time because they didn't want to race on Saturday nights. That was the middle of their weekend. They had things they were doing and they would prefer to race at the end of their weekend. So I heard that over and over again. Now, when we did the survey, I was really surprised to see that it was almost split evenly. I mean, move it back or not move it back. So that gave me pause and, and something to think about. But I do think that if it came back to... Sunday evening, it would be a boon to participation in general. Thanks for that, Mike. What I'd like to move to now is some questions around, as we colloquially or lovingly call them, ringers. So non-series regular drivers that come and join us for a couple of rounds a year. So both why we have people come and join us for just a couple of rounds, what their thoughts are around uh, events that they like to come and join us for, and also what the regulars or the regular series drivers think about having ringers in the series. For those that don't know, the structure of the survey actually changes based on what the respondent identifies themselves as. If you identify yourself as a series regular, you're given one set of questions. If you identify yourself as a, a ringer, uh, or I only come and do the majors 24, you actually get a different set of questions. So yeah, you may not have been aware of that, but there you go. There's a bit of trickery and insight into how the survey works. So in terms of the people that identified themselves as a ringer, Aside from the Majors 24, which obviously is a huge draw to the series, the biggest one that people said that they come to the series to be involved with is the Speedway 500, which is not a surprise. It's, you know, it's one of the, the big three real world events. And I'm sure if we had a Monaco Grand Prix, we'd get plenty of ringers for that as well. What I found quite interesting, Mike, looking at this is they outside of that, there really didn't seem to be a huge people that responded saying that they would come for other events. Was that a surprise to you to see? Things like Intimidator, Formula One, Dirt as well, which obviously is very specialized, even if not as popular in iRacing, but it is a very specialized discipline that people are saying, mm, yeah, I don't think I'll come along just for one of those events. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you that has always surprised me. That was really part of the reason that was sort of our focus of the survey this year. That was the, the thing that I wanted to tackle 
uh, was the idea of ringers in general. It, it has always surprised me how people are st st stuck in what they like and don't branch out from it. Obviously, our series is designed to be a taste of everything, a tour of the world, a tour of motorsport, iconic races. And, you know, for me, I've always been super appealing. And obviously, so do a lot of people that run the series. I, I, it's, it's just surprising to me that that doesn't fit everybody. <laughs> but despite that surprise, I have done this long enough to realize that is, in fact, the case. People will often run what they want to run. And, they're, and you're just not going to convince them otherwise. And the 24 is, is a great example of that. A huge percentage of the people who identified themselves as ringers said that that's the race that they run. And people who run the 24, they like their team events, and that's what they want to run. They like multi-class, they like team, and that's what they want to run. And getting them to do something else is a challenge at best. Yes, regarding the team and endurance side of things, we'll come to that at the end of this podcast around what people thought about that. As far as the regular series races are concerned, their attitudes and their desire to include ringers in the series or not. Within the Discord, we often see a lot of discussion around people that either come in and dominate in a specialty event, or maybe somebody's had a run-in where a non-series regular might have taken them out of a race or impacted their result. And it sounds quite negative. However, the results of the survey once you compiled it all together and people were given a, a free text response as far as having their say on ringers and what they thought of it. But when you boiled it down, there was very, very few who actually did not want the series to include ringers or non-series regulars in the results. It was less than 20% said that they would prefer to not have ringers in. And by far more than 50% said, yes, ringers are welcome. However, Having sat and read all of the, the free text responses, and yes, they do get read, everybody. <laughs> one of the biggest repeated themes was the behavior of ringers is a concern. And whether that's a realistic concern or a perceived concern, people uh, don't want somebody to come along who isn't part of the regular series and actually influence their championship or influence their race result for various different reasons. How would the series answer the sentiment of, we want people to come and do races as a one-off if they're interested, but we don't want it to influence our championship standings. So yeah, like you read all the responses and was super pleasantly surprised. Like you said, the vast majority of people welcome them, want them, realize it's part of the challenge. I'll, I'll tell you a, a little secret that some of the ringers might not like to hear it, but I actually, I view the ringers like AI and the really good AI, we've turned the dial up a long way. And I view the series regulars as the series regulars, and they're the ones that are fighting for the championship. And so to answer your question, I'm not going to answer your question, but I will say that based on the feedback in the survey and based on discussions with the com competition committee, we do have a change that we're going to make with regard to how we handle one-off drivers, ringers, et cetera within the series, they're never going to go away. We're always going to welcome them, but we will handle them a little bit differently. And I think it's going to be really well received, but we'll save that announcement for another day. Right. Uh, the last part of the mid-year survey that I'd like to discuss is around the MEC. I'm going to park that for a minute. After this break, we're going to talk about the second survey that everybody had a chance to respond to, which was around calendar choices and events that they'd really like to see. So after this, we'll get into the calendar discussion. Hey, you know that guy who just before the green flag keys up his mic and asks, anybody got a setup? Well, this is him. This is Adam, and hey, Adam needs some help. On the other hand, this guy over here, this is Steve. Steve is a solid racer, and he knows his way around the garage. Steve's problem is time. With a job and a family, he can't find enough time to build competitive setups and to race as often as he likes. But as luck would have it, Steve knows a secret. He lets the Majors Garage crew chiefs do the setup work so he can focus on the racing. At MajorsGarage.com, Steve can get setups for over 60 cars on the iRacing service. So no matter what series he wants to jump into, he is covered. Somebody, anybody, really should tell Adam. See you at the garage. Okay, so now we're going to get talking about the calendar and the races on the schedule itself. We're not announcing the schedule today. Just put that up, up front. <laughs> However, everyone was given a chance to have their say on what are the source of events, both within the usual classes or categories of racing that we do, and also outside of that, 
that they'd like to see on the calendar. So again, thanks for sharing that with me in advance uh, of this, Mike. I've got, I've, I've got a few tables in front of me with some results and in no particular order, I'm going to pluck a few of these numbers out to throw at you. And the first one that I'm going to throw at you is the biggest standout result is from a statistical perspective, which was when people were asked about historic racing, what sort of thing would they like to do? The thing that had the most support for any question in this survey was people want to see an old school Talladega 500. What did you think when you saw that? Very surprised. Very, very surprised. The, I, I remember it, you know, it, it may not, I don't know if it's anything you ever actually watched in real life, but I remember it as the EA Sports 500 back in the day. But yeah, we, we would run the 87s at Talladega if we would ever do that race. I, I, I would have a hard time putting two super speedways on the schedule. But it was fascinating to see the support for that, for that race in the survey, for sure. People were giving that response with regard to historic racing. And when it came to modern NASCAR questions of where people would like to run, Talladega didn't even get a mention as far as I could see. So whether there's some sort of nostalgic uh, connection with that particular race, and that's why, you know, I take your point on having multiple super speedways on the calendar, but yeah, so maybe there's the event itself more than the track and the car. Well, is, is yeah, I mean, that. so that, yeah, for sure. I mean, the 87s, that's where Bill Elliott set the all-time speed record in NASCAR history was at Talladega in the 87 era, uh, restrictor plate. So I can understand the nostalgia there. And obviously running the 87s with no restrictor plates at Talladega is I mean, you're, you're driving that car for sure. It, it's not going to feel like a restrictor plate race because it isn't one. So I, I get it. I, I totally do. Uh, but it would still be tough. It would still be, I'd have a hard time. You know, we have such limited real estate in our schedule. It would be tough to do it. Uh, but maybe, you never know. So regarding the modern NASCARs, that was the second biggest standout result of any of the single questions, which uh, is a return to the, the World 600 which we did as a historic round last year or the year before, if I remember correctly. For those outside of the US, the World 600 really is the second biggest race after the Daytona 500 of the year, right? It's the one that's run on Memorial Day weekend. People that maybe watch the IndyCar and seen the Indy 500, that's the race that the NASCAR drivers that come and just do the Indy 500, quickly getting in a helicopter to try and go and compete in the same night as the Indy 500 is held. It is the second blue riband event of the year, really, for NASCAR, isn't it? For sure. No doubt. A lot of people would like to see us run that race again. For sure. I remember when I was a kid or a young adult, I actually viewed the World 600. It wasn't called the World 600. But anyway, uh, it was right after the All-Star race, the Lowe's 600 or whatever. I actually viewed that as, as a bigger race than the Indy 500, but I liked it more. Let's just put it that way. For whatever reason, I have no idea. But it's a huge race on the calendar for sure. And understandably why people would want to bring that one back. So while we're in the old US of A series discussions, IndyCar and also IMSA slash sports, sports cars. One of the, t we've just said about the World 600 being, you know, for, for instance, the, the second biggest race of, of the NASCAR calendar. I'm going to talk IMSA first and then IndyCar. The, the, the Daytona road course was the biggest support in terms of where we should be taking an IMSA race. However, there was also really good support for Road Atlanta, Watkins Glen and Seabrook. Those are the four big endurance races that IMSA hold every single year. And there's a great amount of support for inclusion of those races in a sprint perspective in the major series. How would we feel about including several of the main endurance events from the US within the major series in a single year? I mean, it would be, again, we have such limited real estate. Even if we expand to 12 races, I could definitely see, I could see us doing two. For sure. Oh, yeah, we've done that in the past. Three would be maybe be pushing it though, in terms of diversity within the schedule. But they're great races, like you said, the Daytona 24, Petit Le Mans, Watkins Glen, and the Sebring 12. I mean, those are iconic, awesome races. I racing tends to do those every single year for special events as well. But we haven't done the Petit Le Mans in a long time. That would be the one that I would be super interested in doing, just because it's been such so long off our radar. But that's just, that's just a personal thing. It's not like you've got any influence over the calendar or anything. No, Mark, so but, just, you know, I just cross I, your fingers on that one. Try to twist some arms. Yeah. And on the IndyCar side, uh, th this one really stood out to me. I am a personal huge fan of racing at Long Beach. I'll race basically any sorts of car on the iRacing service that I can if they're racing at Long Beach. I love it. It was the IndyCar race that got the greatest support, obviously outside the Indy 500, for inclusion on our calendar. 
despite, and I know this for a fact, there is great disdain or distaste from a lot of people for the Long Beach circuit because of the wild incident field nature of races that are there. Was it surprising for you to see that? And why would you, or what do you think would lead to a track that a lot of people don't like having the most support for inclusion in, in our calendar? Yep. So yes, I was surprised. Not because I don't, it's, it's my favorite IndyCar race outside of the Indy 500. And it's the one I wanted the most for the longest time on our schedule, you know, so when they finally finished it, it was really, really exciting. We've now run a couple of times at Long Beach and I would have thought that opinions or enthusiasm would have waned a little bit for it. So surprised to see that it was the number one pick among the IndyCar races. But I'm not surprised on the flip side of that coin, because again, the, the nature of our series and the nature of the people who race in our series, you know, these are motorsport enthusiasts and they, they you know, they're big on history and they're big on you know, what is truly a special and iconic event. And, you know, the, the IndyCar race at Long Beach is, in my opinion, the premier open wheel race on American soil above and beyond F1. In, it's just my opinion. I'm probably wrong, but that's my opinion. So if, from that perspective, no, it didn't surprise me. But like you said, on the service, Long Beach is a ghost town in officials, which is a tragedy. Moving away from the U.S., People were asked what circuit they would like used for the annual Formula One race that is always going to be part of the uh, Majors series, being one of the marquee events, uh, Formula Majors. Very diverse responses in terms of what circuits people would like that race to be held at. Yep. My personal feeling is if we had Monaco, and yes, I know, every, you know, repeat everything that's just been said about Long Beach and more for Monaco, however, it being one of the, the Triple Crown I think that there would be a huge amount of support to do it until people tried to actually shoehorn a Formula One car around there. However, with the absence of that on the iRacing service, it really does seem to be a very mixed response in terms of where people would like to have this race held. Is this the sort of event that we should be looking at majors to settle on one or two tracks for it to always be held at? Or do you think this is mm. going to be the sort of event that's going to be passed around a very long list of circuits from one year to another? Well, that's a great question, actually. I've never considered putting it on a single track or even a, a small rotation. But it's not a terrible idea, to be honest. F1 is interesting in that outside of Monaco, I don't, I don't think, and maybe Spa, I suppose, but outside of those two, I, I don't think that you would consider any of the races on the calendar as marquee more so than any other race, which is really weird. They're all equal. Again, with just a couple of exceptions on obviously Monaco. But even the drivers hate Monaco. I mean, if they're just going to be real honest with you. But it still is the marquee. It is the marquee race. And if we got Monaco, I, I mean, I would say this right now for sure, regardless of anybody else's opinion, we would run it the very first year we had it without question. It would not even be a debate. But, you know, would we run it beyond that? <laughs> I mean, sort of depends on how it goes. And, you know, your inkling is it might not go well. And that's probably fair. Monza, Suzuka, Montreal. The Red Bull Ring, Interlagos, you know, Coda, Hockenheim, Silverstone, you know, good support in the survey for all of those. And I think that just goes back to what I said about you'd have a hard time saying is one of these premier versus the rest. And I think it's just a matter of opinion um, from each individual person. From, so from that perspective, I kind of like that we rotated around. We've, we've done Monza a couple of times. We've done Suzuka. We've done Montreal. We've done Interlagos. We've done Red Bull. Um, we've done Silverstone last year, uh, we're doing Zandvoort uh, this year. The only thing we haven't, we haven't done that. We haven't done the old San Marino at Imola. We've not done Barcelona. Funnily enough, those are two of the least supported in the survey. We've not done uh, circuit of the Americas. I like the idea that we rotated around. Obviously the Indy 500 and, and Daytona 500, they're always in the same track. And so our Speedway 500 and, and Intimidator will always be at the same track. If you look at it like golf, for example, you know, you got the Masters is always at Augusta, but then you got the U.S. Open and the British Open and the, and whatnot. They rotate around at a pretty significant number of places, and I think that's for the best. So my guess would say that we would still include most, whatever we have available to us on the F1 side, F1 calendar side. You know, if we ever got, you know, Melbourne or, or something, like that, we'd always love to see new tracks, of course, that are supported and, and they would love to try something new, whether it's Monaco or not. Regarding the car use for the Formula One round, there was very even support between the two modern Formula One cars on the iRacing service and 
some substitutes, uh, being the super formula car, which a lot of people really, really enjoy driving. I think it's probably, and this isn't to, to, you know, talk down about cars that aren't formula one cars, but I think a lot of people find that a much easier, a much more entertaining car to drive because it doesn't quite kill you at every opportunity, like some of the formula one cars in service do. And then also the Lotus 79 had a lot of support as well. The last few Formula Majors have all been in whatever the most modern Formula One car on the iRacing service has been and will be again this year. Would you consider running the, and I'm doing air quotes on the podcast again, which I always say is pointless, but I'm doing it again. Would you use something that's not a Formula One car for the Formula Majors round? Yeah, no, I, I was shocked to see the support for the Super Formula and it's a great car. So it, it would be divergent from reality a little bit, but to be honest, we're never running the most modern F1 car anyway, because they don't give us the data until they stop running the damn thing. So I could see us doing that. And if it was, you know, to me, it's criminal. The Formula Majors round is the least popular of our crown jewels and by a fair margin. Uh, it should be a very popular race, especially, you know, now that we're doing full course cautions in it. We try to emulate uh, Q1, Q2, Q3 in it and really make it a spectacle all the way through it deserves to be a really popular race. So if Super Formula is something that would make that happen, to me, that is true enough to reality to absolutely consider using or Lotus 79 or something else that is close enough and true enough for sure. Okay. So the, the last one that I want to talk about is what I've classed as other road. No surprise to me that essentially what I would consider to be prestigious endurance events in sports car racing, the Bathurst 1000, the Nürburgring 24 and the 24 hours of Spa being the GT3 race or GT3 only race were the three that had the biggest support. Those three all come from a very similar genre of racing. It would be unlikely in, I would think it would be unlikely. You can tell me if I'm wrong, that we would ever get all three of those in a single season in a major series, as you said, limited real estate, fairly similar events. However, would it, having had the discussion around potentially having a small number of circuits that we would use for Formula One on a rotation basis, but you know, possibly not. Is that something that we could bring in or that the series might consider bringing in as a, not one of the marquee events, but a, you will always get one of mm -hmm. insert very short list of, uh, uh, prestigious worldwide events here in every single major series. Yeah, we should, to be totally honest. Because those, I mean, again, those are big ones. And we haven't done the Bathurst 1000 in a few years. It's been at least three. So it's overdue for sure. The GT3 Spa race, I don't remember the last time we did it. We've done it many times. I mean, we've done the series a long time. But to your point, they're popular enough that we probably should include one of them annually. It would make a lot of sense. Next year, we're doing the Majors Endurance Championship. Everyone that filled out the survey was given uh, a chance to express their likelihood or otherwise of participating in that series. And one of the things though, that really stood out to me in the responses from Majors 24 only survey respondents. So this is the people that only come and do the 24 every year, either don't know or don't care to join us for the major series itself. One of the questions that they were asked was what would entice you to come and do some regular series races with us? And by far and away, the most common answer to that was more team events. The questions that they were asked at the end of the survey included both that. And also, would you come and participate in an endurance championship similar to the MEC, which we had trailed in the Majors 24 podcast, the information that was coming out during the Majors 24 or the run-up to the Majors 24. So people were aware of it. We asked the question, would you participate in it? Now, I can throw some numbers at you if you like, Mike, but if you want to, if you want to say anything on that generally before I do, please feel free to step in and do so. Otherwise the numbers were pretty staggering. So for, for people that don't participate in the major series itself, 50% of respondents said they would come and do the majors endurance championship. Now, if you extrapolate that across the entire base of people that come and do the majors 24 with us every year, which is potentially unrealistic, however, there is a huge amount of support for a majors 24 style series to be run. There's a lot of people saying they're interested in it. Less than 10% of respondents said, no, I wouldn't come and do it. Right. You know, obviously we were asking this six months before it was going to occur. Lots of people were saying that they were unsure. Would they, wouldn't they? But even that far out, we had 50% of people saying yes, they, that they would come and do it. 
those numbers were largely reflected in the regular series participants. Mike, there's clearly a huge, huge appetite for this. When you saw the results for this though, what, if anything, did this change in terms of how you think the endurance series will be put together and run for next year? Didn't change anything, but it did solidify the fact that it was a really great idea that you've been advocating for. So kudos to you for that. Yeah. When you, the, the number that, that really stood out was the 9.4% of respondents that said, no, they would not. You're telling me that 90% of the people are either definitely in or considering it. I, that's not, I mean, we have over 3000 people participate in the majors 24. So like you said, if you sort of extrapolate that out, that's insanity. So I don't expect that to come to fruition, but we know it's going to be popular. And, and, you know, as you and I were discussing before, there's a void here. I don't know why there's a void here, but there is not a lot of high level really professionally done endurance leagues. There's a few, a couple, but it seems like more have gone out of business than are coming in. So that's just surprising to me. You know, you can't move around without finding a NASCAR league or an IndyCar league, but the number of really, really well done endurance leagues is small. So we're going to join that fray. So that's great. And it's going to be really interesting to see how the take up of this series goes over the next couple of months as we start to put things like regulations, registrations, expressions of interest, those sorts of things out for the MEC. And I'll trail now that the, the next podcast will, we'll be having a, we've got a really exciting announcement to make about the MEC, which we've known about for quite a while. We've known was coming and uh, it'll be really great to share with everybody. I'll also be doing a Q and A on the MEC uh, once the draft regulations have been put out, which will be in advance of the next episode. So yeah, the, the next one will be MEC focused and it's going to be great to have that amount of support is just really, really exciting. And that's, I think shows that there's faith in the product of the majors 24. And so the support will be there for the MEC and it'd be great to get that support to spread over into the regular series itself as well. And I know that the competition committee has been pleased with the responses in the survey and has taken on board a lot of the, the sentiments and, and opinions expressed in these two surveys. Yeah, the results of that will come through, not just in the calendar that's going to make up the, the, the series for 2025, but also the administrative and regulatory side of the series. Some of those things that people have wanted to see some changes in as well. So it's an exciting time for majors. Thanks for listening to this survey edition of Inside the Majors. The next episode is going to be majors endurance championship focused. There'll be some more information coming out on the Discord and via email. Get your questions in for that and hopefully you'll be able to join me for that one in a couple of weeks time. So yeah, thanks for sharing some of the insights from the survey with us today, Mike. And there were, for, for people that are listening to this uh, on, later on the podcast, there actually were some people that have jumped in and listened to this live and I'll be trailing when the MEC podcast is going to be done so that we can have some live questions in that as well. So hopefully plenty of you can make it along for that and we'll see you next time on Inside the Majors.